Turn on your projectors and follow me down the rabbit hole. J.J. Hatter welcomes you to Analysis in Wonderland. Today's topic, the 1999 Hallmark production of Alice in Wonderland. Up till now, all of the screen adaptations of Lewis Carroll's Alice stories we've discussed to this point have been theatrical releases, feature films. Today, however, we're looking at a rendition not intended for a big-budget theatrical release, but rather for the small screen. Produced by Hallmark Entertainment on a budget of $21 million, this 1999 adaptation of the Carol books once again blends elements of both Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass together, as most tend to do. The film is directed by Nick Willing. This would not be his only encounter with Carol, as Willing later acted as both writer and director on the sci-fi miniseries Alice. The TV movie was once again an extravaganza of sorts, with various big-name actors cast in the roles of the classic characters. Unlike many other versions which tend to cast relative unknowns in the role of Alice, even the casting of the main character was given to an actress who had already been in numerous film roles and made a big splash on screen prior to this production, Tina Majorino. In fact, this production would be the last film Majorino starred in for a few years, as she retired from acting and did not return to the world of the screen till 2004 in Napoleon Dynamite. Since then, she has popped up many times on both TV and in movies. Perhaps the most noteworthy thing about this production was its use of special effects. Digital effects were still in their relative infancy at the time the film was being made, and long before Tim Burton and company got their greedy little mitts on the idea, this movie actually made extensive use of CGI to create its world and characters, giving various characters exaggerated movements and attributes, as well as making the world seem larger and more vibrant by mixing practical effects in with computer-generated ones. Many of the practical effects and characters were created by the Jim Henson Creature Shop, and these particular creations were a major selling point for the film as well as some of the most well-remembered parts of the picture. The television movie first aired on NBC on February 28th. It was received fairly well, with over 25 million viewers making it the sixth highest rated program that entire week, and even earning no less than four Emmy Awards for makeup, costume design, visual effects, and musical composition. In point of fact, this adaptation is part of what I personally like to refer to as the Big Four, the four most well-known and fondly remembered versions of the story to date, the other three being the 1951 Disney film, the Tim Burton movies, and the America McGee's Alice video games. As far as live-action productions that are based directly on the books go, as opposed to reimaginings or sequels or anything of that sort, this is the single most enjoyed to date. However, in typical faction, Critical reception was often less than to be admired. In fact, the movie only holds a 33% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, with only one and a half stars to its name. So once again, we ask ourselves the same question. Is this a good film and worthy adaptation that just doesn't seem to get the love it deserves from critics? Or are the poor reviews and ratings deserved despite apparent acceptance by public viewers and even the awards? Well, let's start with the cast, because honestly, aside from the visual style and effects, that's probably the most noteworthy thing about this production. Once again, we have an adaptation with so much star power in it, I swear the night sky looks positively barren in comparison. The thing about productions like this is that you have to be very careful who you cast and how. There's nothing wrong, in my opinion, with casting big stars in these iconic roles. While the obvious reason is to gain viewership and soak up the revenue that results, this practice is nothing new in the case of Alice or any other classic story. And it's also worth saying that the actors in question wouldn't be big names or at least highly prolific figures in performance art if there were no good reason. However, you face two big risks when you engage in this practice. The first is that the actors may be so recognizable and interesting that the character gets lost. You're so focused on who's in the costume, you don't care about the actual fictional figure before you. You just see an actor playing a character, not the character themselves. The other risk is that if the performer in question is either miscast or simply doesn't care about the work to begin with, you're going to have some problems to deal with. Having said that, the good news is that the latter issue is never present here. Everyone involved is clearly having fun and trying their hardest to make this show work, and while some of them are perhaps surprising choices, none of them are necessarily bad ones. If anything is wrong with the character, it isn't really the actor's fault, and 99.9% .9 of these depictions are absolutely marvelous. At times, however, I do feel the first issue becomes a problem. For example, you have Gene Wilder as the Mock Turtle, his actual performance is good, don't get me wrong. He's having a ball, he's totally enveloped in what he's doing, and... Well, it's Gene Wilder. If anybody fits in this universe, it's gonna be Willy Wonka. 
However, due to both the costume design and the way the character is depicted, much more happy-go-lucky than the character in the book, I'm sorry, all I see when watching this is young Frankenstein in a turtle suit, not the Mock Turtle. In fact, the costumes are another element I have to discuss. I know that costuming earned an award for this production, and in point of fact, yes, the costumes here are extremely good. Owing much to the colors and designs of the Tenniel illustrations as many versions do, but also going in their own direction. Much of the visual aesthetic here feels like a pop-up book or a child's toy chest brought to life, and the costumes help out there significantly. However, there's a very strange inconsistency going on with the animal characters specifically, and as anybody who knows anything about Wonderland is aware, there are many animal characters. As I said before, several of the characters are brought to life by the Jim Henson Creature Shop, through animatronics and specialty outfits. But then you have characters like Pat and Bill at the White Rabbit's house. Bill, of course, is a lizard in the books, and in this one it seems Pat is too. And the way they achieve this idea is by having the actors dress in relatively human clothes, but with colors, textures, and makeup effects that give them a sort of reptilian appearance, rather than outright dressing them up as lizards. The same thing is done for the caucus race characters, such as the Dodo, the Lori, and so forth. The concept is great with these, but it leaves one confused. Why are some of the animal characters just animals, and why are some of them people with animal-like attributes? There's a very brief moment where the mouse with the long, sad tail transforms from a real-life rodent into basically a man who just has rather rodent-esque features. So what's going on there? Is he a were-mouse? How come he can shapeshift while the Dormouse can't? I know one could argue I'm looking into things too deeply, but even when I saw this as a kid, it really confused me why some of the animals were animals and some of them were not. At least with things like the 1933 and 1972 films, there's consistency. One of the weirdest effects is the Cheshire Cat. The character is played by Whoopi Goldberg. Sort of. Goldberg's head, fully made up as the cat, is superimposed onto a puppet body, and sometimes a CGI body, for most of the character's scenes. I know a lot of people like this take on the character, and I will say that it's interesting to see a female Cheshire Cat for a change, and of course Goldberg tries her best. But I've never been a big fan of this version, mostly because the effects just deeply unnerve me, and I don't think they were really supposed to. Once again, it raises a weird question about the animal characters too. How come the griffin looks like a griffin, yet the Cheshire Cat has a very recognizably human face? The effects and characters created by the Jim Henson Creature Shop are interesting, and I will say they usually work. The griffin in particular is a masterpiece of puppeteering. Apparently it took five people to make it work, but for some reason only three are credited in the film itself, Adrian Getley, Robert Tagner, and Dave Barclay. The other two puppeteers for the record were Mark Hunter and Adrian Parrish. The voice for the character is provided by one Donald Sinden. I'm also very fond of the Dormouse, voiced by Nigel Plaskett, and puppeteered by both Plaskett and the aforementioned Mr. Barclay. Also the Pig Baby, performed by Adrian Parrish. It looks... Uh, well, you can see the picture on the screen, but to be fair, that's actually a pretty close replica to the character illustrated in the book. And while the puppet for this character is more simple than the rest, it's still very effective. However, for literally every other puppet character beyond them, I feel as if everything good I have to say must be followed by a HOWEVER caveat. The March Hare, voiced by Francis Wright and puppeteered by Adrian Getley and Robert Tigner, is very funny and works well alongside not only the Dormouse, but also Martin Short's Mad Hatter. However, I swear to heaven he looks more like a March donkey. The White Rabbit is an interesting experiment. Light sounds of machinery are actually heard in the film itself whenever he moves, as if to suggest clockworks. The character is voiced by Richard Coombs and puppeteered by Kieran Shaw. Most of the time he works, however, in the trial scene, it looks like he's been turned into a malfunctioning amusement park animatronic. The Garden of Live Flowers features very good depictions of the flowers in question, however, in this case, it isn't so much the puppets that are the problem, but rather the fact that it looks less like a garden and more like a bunch of random flower patches in the middle of a forest. Did Mary Mary Quite Contrary drop a few seeds while walking through the woods one day? Alright, so far it probably seems like I've been railing at this movie, nitpicking it half to death but I feel I should point out that I do in fact enjoy this movie. It's earned its reputation, at least among Alice fans, pretty well. But I can't help but feel a lot of the reasons so many seem to recognize and enjoy this one is due to nostalgia. It's not necessarily a bad take on Alice, it's just a little befuddling and not always very consistent. However, I will say there are a lot of good things about it too. Even when the cast is perhaps too recognizable for their own good, they do a great job. 
As I've said before, Alice is a very character-driven piece. There's not much in the way of a plot, so a solid cast is an absolute necessity. Speaking of plot, this one follows in Disney's footsteps by giving the story a bit of a moral grounding. The movie takes a hint from The Wizard of Oz once again, not so much in terms of its moral, but in terms of its structure. It starts with a garden party being hosted at Alice's home. Every single character we see at the garden party, as well as various things Alice comes across in her house, becomes a part of Wonderland. Alice's whole reason for running after the White Rabbit isn't just curiosity, but also a desire to escape from her responsibilities. She's supposed to perform a song and dance for the guests, but she has stage fright and in childlike fashion tries to hide from her parents. It's then that she sees the rabbit, and from that point on, she explores Wonderland not trying to get back home, but actually hoping she can stay. Throughout the story, the various characters Alice encounters help her, either directly or inadvertently, to discovering courage and confidence, and learning to face her fears. It's not till the end that Alice learns to forge her own path and conquer her fears, rather than worrying about living up to expectations or running and hiding. This is actually a common lesson I've noticed in several adaptations. Rewind to 14 years earlier, and one finds the 1985 miniseries starring Natalie Gregory, where the same basic concept of conquering fear was used as a moral grounding for the story. Flash forward 11 years after this one, and the same themes found in this production were toyed with in a very different way in the 2010 Tim Burton movie. These aren't the only versions to cover these concepts either. I'm not sure why this theme seems to be so common, but I suppose it works well. Back to the cast. I've been sort of pussyfooting around them a little, but for a very good reason. If you were to ask me to name a standout performance or two, well, first of all, that's what my top six is at the end of these videos are for, but second of all, in regards to the film, that's really hard to do. So many great actors, so many great takes on the characters, it's literally impossible to list them all and go into detail about them without making this piece interminably long. Major characters of great renown, like Miranda Richardson as the Queen of Hearts, Martin Short as the Mad Hatter, Elizabeth Spriggs as the Duchess, George Went and Robbie Coltrane as Tweedledee and Tweedledum, and still more, are portrayed decently, of course. But then you have the more minor and lesser-known characters, such as Sheila Hancock as the Cook, Jason Byrne as Pat, Peter Iyer and Hugh Lloyd as the Frog and Fish Footman, and again, still more, who are often just as outstanding as the bigger names in the picture. The list goes on. As far as the music goes, I'm not really sure what to say about it, it's a little tricky to describe. I suppose in comparing it to the earlier movies, its style falls somewhere in the middle. While the 1933 film and the Disney film treated things as bouncy and whimsical, and the 1972 film took a more dreamlike and slightly surreal tone with things, this one uses a bit of both. It never feels inconsistent though, and I think it helps the film in many places. The movie is mostly fairly light-hearted, but given both the subject matter and the themes it's dealing with, it does help give it sort of a dangerous, unsettling edge from time to time. As well as various treatments of Carol's songs and poems, we once again have some original tunes in the mix, and while none of them are very long, they are nevertheless catchy and fun. One last quick note, a common complaint I hear about this movie is that it is too long, and it is a long one as far as Alice adaptations go, locking in at over two hours. Most adaptations only last between an hour and about an hour and a half, counting the credits. Even feature film versions usually don't go much longer than a little over a hundred minutes. I personally never minded that much, but I will concede that at times the picture is a little slow-paced, which is perhaps a little odd for such a crazy story as this. However, it's not as dry as some people make it sound, and hey, if you can sit through bloody Avengers Endgame without much worry, I'm pretty sure this won't drag you down too much. It's all a matter of taste. So we come to the conclusions. Rating 7 out of 10. This film isn't quite as clunky as the 1933 Paramount film, nor as technically achieved as the Disney film, nor as much of a personal favorite for me as the 1972 film. It falls somewhere in between all of these. It has its flaws, but ultimately the cast, the style, and the clear passion of the project help pull it through. I cannot for the life of me understand why critics apparently dislike this adaptation so much, but to be fair, it seems most takes on Alice just don't seem to be for screen critics at this rate, and the ones that are tend to be quite obscure. Top 6 Performances and Characters This one was a really hard set to sort out. George Went and Robbie Coltrane as Tweedledee and Tweedledum. They may not be twins, but these two are very fun to watch. Also, hi Hagrid. Simon Russell Beale and Miranda Richardson as the King and Queen of Hearts. 
Initially, I was just going to give this to Richardson's rather shrill queen, but I very much like the king in this version too. At times, Richardson's exaggerated voice can be a bit grating, but A, I think that's intentional, and B, in my opinion, it never goes too far. As for the king, he's a little nastier than most portrayals of the character, but wonderfully funny and still very lovable. Martin Short is the Mad Hatter. Also credit to his March Hare and the Dormouse. Not only does he look absolutely perfect in the part, especially with the CGI <clears throat> augmentations made to his appearance, but he's clearly having a blast. Much like Richardson, at times he's a little too screamish, but he never struck me as overdoing it. Richard Coombs and Kieran Shaw is the White Rabbit. Despite my comments on the puppet work towards the end of the film, for the most part he works extremely well. This tends to be one of the first versions of the character that pops into my head whenever I think of him. Tina Majorino is Alice, very sweet and vulnerable, but not to an excessive degree. I like seeing her journey as she learns and tries to cope with the world around her. On a personal note, I like how they made her dress yellow rather than the standard blue. This was actually the color of Alice's costume in the nursery Alice, and it's a little attention to detail I appreciate. And Christopher Lloyd is the White Knight. This scene and this performance make the movie for me. Of all the actors and performances in the film, this one comes the closest in my mind, the way I imagine the character in the book. Well, along with the Dormouse. Lloyd is lovable, sympathetic, and in his own way rather powerful and poignant. I don't see Doc Brown in a costume here, I see the White Knight. I can watch this sequence again and again. Incidentally, when Nick Willing tackled Wonderland again in the aforementioned miniseries, he once again handled the White Knight perfectly. And that version is probably the only competition this one has for my favorite take on the role. I guess Willing just really, really knows how to handle this character. Next time, the 2010 and 2016 Tim Burton movies, Alice in Wonderland, and Alice Through the Looking Glass. Oh dear.